Their defense is a joke. What it really comes down to is I would love to have either of them. They don't have a, a prayer in their secondary. They have nothing. So you're saying just don't draft Blunt? I'm saying don't draft Blunt. He was unbelievably efficient last year. You know that they use their running backs in the passing game a ton. I'm drafting him tonight. That's Team Huevos. Huevos <laughs> <laughs> Gigantes. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Sylvester, joined as always by Mike Taglier. Give us a follow on Twitter if you don't already at Bobby Fantasy Pro and at Mike Taglier NFL Tags. What's going on, buddy? Oh, nothing much, man. It's good to have you back on the show. It's it's Friday. I am going to be talking some football with uh, two of my favorite people in the world. So it's a good day. Yeah, and we've got a great guy, Joe Pizapia. You guys know him. You guys were probably hoping he was going to be the guest on today's show. He's <laughs> at Joe Pizapia17. Author of the number one best-selling fantasy black book series, and guess what? It just came out. It's already number one on Amazon. Joe, congratulations, man. Well, I want to thank, uh, first of all, I want to thank all the, uh, the my parents and all the people behind me all this time. <laughs> I just want to say, a lot goes into this sort of thing when you're trying to make a book special. Oh, wait, they're playing me off. They're playing me off. No, it's uh, it's wild. Like, we, we've hit number one in football books before. Like, we always hit number one in fantasy. That's my expectation. I mean, come on. If we're not hitting number one in fantasy, what the hell are we doing here? But to hit number one in football books the first week of June when we come out, like we're ahead of James Conner's book and all these other books, like actual football players, that's that's mm-hmm. wild to me. And I just want to thank... He's got, like, b- a picture of his big muscles and yeah, stuff Yeah, well, book. apparently my like, muscles Like, did you do that? Is that hit. why it's selling so you well? You know what? I should, do, I should do a cover with me flexing like that, too. I'm not quite as big as James Conner's <laughs> bicep, I it can would tell not, you that. It would not be number one. No, it's, they're not bad, <laughs> Tags. They're not bad, but they're not James Conner level. I'm telling you that right now. But it is... <laughs> I just want to thank everybody who went out there early and were waiting for the book and got it early. And just, like, that's that's amazing. And, uh, and of course, I'm very lucky to have you two beautiful people contributing this year into the uh Thanks, the fantasy expert panel there and kind of join us it's it's great because i feel like you know we are that independent voice where there's a lot of big box fantasy stuff going on at the espns and the and the cbs's and blah 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 but you know what like there's a lot of great independent football analysts out there and i like giving right. them a platform and i like creating something for them and something that's for the people to use not just for everybody to spout opinions like black book is about your fantasy team is about your usage of things. It's about your leagues and trying to run everything from high stakes to best ball to the, your super flex, everything. Whereas sure. a lot of other stuff out there is about, look at me, look at my opinion. I'm a smart fantasy analyst. And I, I got, you know, <laughs> you know, that's just not going to get people very far. Well, here's the plan for today's show. Not only do we have Joe on the show, but we're going to be talking breakouts. Everyone's favorite topic, right guys? <laughs> well, it, it's a very loose. You don't topic. think so, man? I, Everyone I, I, loves breakouts, man. These are the league winners, baby. We do, but here's the thing: I am such a realist when it comes to fantasy football, and like you know, I, I deal with projections all the time. You I mean you're a locked inside a box? Call Bobby, it what you, it is, dude. This is Bobby's show, 100. percent Because Bobby is the hot take artiste. No, this, <laughs> isn't about, this isn't about hot takes. It's about what could happen, what could win your league. You know, like Dalvin Cook last year when I demanded people draft him. Christian McCaffrey the year before when I demanded people draft him. Tags bet against Christian McCaffrey, dude. This is your chance to win the league. Well, Tags well, won a lot of leagues last. Let me tell you something. Tags came on my show. He came. On, I mean, I did shows with him here where we talked about like bold predictions and things like that, and. And I want to give him credit because he was the guy last year saying Aaron Jones is going to finish as an RB1. You're right. And you, you were yeah. saying it everywhere. And you said it on my show, you said it here. And so, you know, so that that counts. Like, that was a breakout, you know. So you, you could do a victory lap. And if you don't want to, I'll, I'll you know, put you on my shoulders and carry around the uh, track. <laughs> what a hot take, Tags. Holy cow, man. I can't believe you said Aaron Jones would be yeah, an RB1 yeah, last year. He is well, like the king he- of hot takes. Yeah, no, I'm the king of hot takes, yeah. <laughs> a third or a fourth round running back that I said would go first round this year, and he's not going first round, and that's not due to his play. It has to do with Matt LaFleur and how much of a dummy he is. Yeah. Uh, but uh, right in your cram hole, LaFleur. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're going we're gonna to try and uh, nail some of those guys in, this, in today's show. Yeah, so we're going to start out with the breakout running backs. These are guys who could finish. Um, right now they're going in the top 60 overall picks, okay? They could jump up to that first or second round value, depending on where they're being drafted right now. Um, Tags, why don't you start us off? Who do you see it being? 
I mean, my uh, my pick to be the Aaron Jones this year is Kenyon Drake. Don, jerk. Um, <laughs> I mean, well, it, we should have let mean, the guest. We should have let the guest go first. I don't know what I was thinking. No, no, no. What no, were you thinking? This is good because it's funny. We we don't we we never do this. We never compare notes before we come on the show. And I think this right. is great. Like when when all of us agree, because we all have like very informed opinions. I think it's really cool that you know, like we're all on the same page about something. It's I think that speaks volumes to it. So go ahead, speak volumes, Tags. Yeah, no, I I mean I'm I'm a huge fan of Drake, and like so when when we first started doing like all the off season shows, and and I saw Drake's ADP sitting around RB fourteen, RB fifteen. I didn't really understand it, and I said that I would take him as a, as a top ten running back in, in redraft leagues, and then it moved all the way up to the point where I said if you wanted to take him as the number six running back overall. I'd have no issue with it, uh, and I still stand that way just because I feel like he's tied to an offense that Cliff Kingsbury, he wanted to run a lot of plays last year. Unfortunately, his offense wasn't extremely efficient. Uh, you know, you had uh, the defense couldn't keep any – they couldn't they couldn't stay at the field, basically. So they were not running those plays that you wanted to, those – those. you know, I know he said 80 plays per game, but realistically, I think that – I think it's a, a realistic outcome where they could shoot for 68, 70 plays per game, and that adds a ton of play opportunity. Right. Kenyon Drake, once he came to the offense, he obviously – highlighted the fact that he can play there uh finished as the number four running back from when he arrived and uh the fact that they shipped off david johnson basically said that we're ready to ride Kenyon drake he's on a one-year deal basically under this uh transition tag and uh he's playing for another contract he only has i think 400 something uh, career carries under his belt so he's not used and abused he's a young running back he he's just fantastic he fits this system extremely well and now yeah. deandre hopkins there is no way that defenses can come at this team and say, we're going to load the box. Just, Kenny and Drake is the last of their concerns, basically, when you have uh, Kyler Murray out there who can run the ball. You have Fitz as a possession-style guy. Christian Kirk can do a lot of things. And you have DeAndre Hopkins, who's just, well, he's one of the best receivers in the NFL. So um, you want to tie yourself to these high-scoring offenses and Kenyon Drake. Again, I can make the case for him being the number six running back off boards, and if you want to take him at the end of the first, top of the second, I have no issue with it. Fast pace, too, and right now his ECR is 21, so... Um... That's overall, not for running backs. He's running back number 11, so he's probably going to be going near the end of the second, early third round. Now, Joe, you were going to say uh, Kenyon Drake. Yeah, I well. was, and uh, I've been a Kenyon Drake for a year, guy for years now, and it has not been pretty. Let me tell you, I've taken a lot of abuse, and it's yeah. worse because you get like those teases where they, like Adam Gase would let him play. <laughs> yep. And you see him yep. and go, well, why isn't this guy carrying the ball all the time? And then, you right. know, it, it, we kind of went through this in a way before with Lamar Miller. I think Drake is a different kind of talent, obviously. But, you know, Miller was – the usage was weird. And the next thing he goes, and oh, look, he's on tech, he's in the Texans now. And he's, you know, going for 1,000-yard seasons, basically. And he's very productive RB2. Well, isn't that funny? You just kind of, you know, leave him alone and let him do his thing. But Drake, I thought, had a lot of talent and – I just don't get it. Like, I don't know if he was a bad clubhouse guy. I don't know whatever it is, or if it's just Adam Gase just, you know, having... Being Adam you know, Gase. I, that's, that's what I would imagine. And Elliot Chris agrees with me, too. And Elliot, formerly of TQE, big DFS guy, he did the running back profiles in the Black Book, and he came up with some great nuggets there, too. And, you know, I always consult with everybody as we kind of put these things together in the Black Book. And uh, some of the things he came up with, which was awesome, like he scored 14 or more PPR points in four of eight games. Uh, and and also he was pointing out that Cardinals offense, as Mike was kind of alluding to, gives you a fair amount of really fine running back performances. Uh, you know, even even David Johnson had two finishes in the top five uh, certain weeks. So that's something to keep in mind as well. That um, you know the Cardinals produced six top five weeks for running backs across sixteen games and three different running backs. And from the time he got there on. I understand he had a couple bigger games, but at the same time, when you're talking about volume, when you're talking about volume of the offense, when you're talking about a guy who can catch the ball at the backfield, and now you've added a legitimate wide receiver in his prime in DeAndre Hopkins, I think that can only help a guy like Kenyon Drake. And I just think this is a, a unique opportunity, like Mike said, where there's a lot of people who doubt, a lot of people who aren't ready to buy in, who might want to, mm -hmm. that this is your last opportunity to kind of get him at a value because I think the ROI is fantastic this year in 2020. Are you guys ready for my pick? I am. It's going to make you laugh. You are going to be astonished. Kalen Balazs. Here, no, just kidding. Here's my big hot take. <laughs> the name I wrote down was Kenny Drake. No, was it really? That's awesome. All three of us wrote down Kenny Drake. Well, I think it's Kenny Drake, of us guys. In the Black Book did AJ Green too for like the guy who's being undervalued the most. At Hold on, we're getting there. We're oh getting. Well, goodness. I don't know if he can really be a breakout. No, he can't. But right, undervalued, yeah. I thought it was funny. Like yeah. everybody submits them and then we assemble them, and I'm looking. I was like, well, that's funny. <laughs> we're all yeah, like yeah. every single person yeah. put AJ Green right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not going to add on to Kenny Drake. You guys covered everything. I will say it's not Miles Sanders. Everyone thinks Miles Sanders has this like elite upside. 
Yeah, if Doug Peterson like gets hit by a bus, <laughs> he's not going well, away. They're... So I'll, I'll, hold on a second. I'm starting to buy into this a little bit oh, more. Oh, no, 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 no. The reason I am is because I really did think that Philadelphia was going to add another running back. They're if going they to. go into the season with just the guys on the roster that they have right now, I'm buying in. I would draft Miles Sanders ahead of someone like Josh Jacobs, 100%. I'm not going to take him over Whoa. Kenyon Drake, but uh, I would be moving Miles Sanders up my draft rankings because as I've ranked him now, I, I keep anticipating them to sign a running back, whether it's LaShawn McCoy, Devonta Freeman. I don't know, um, but it – uh, I'm with you, it's Tags. I'm like, I'm going to support you. I'm going to hold your hand through this because I'm with you. The fact that they haven't gotten the – they didn't get Carlos Hyde. They're not like – so far, at least anyway, they didn't get mm-hmm. that guy, quote unquote. Yep. And Boston Scott's there, and I get that. And yeah, he'll have He's a couple fine. series or whatever, and that's yeah. cool. Like, I don't expect Miles Sanders to be carrying the ball 25 times, but Miles Sanders is efficient, and I think that there's something to be said for that. I think we're getting to an age where we have to pay more attention to efficiency – because it, you, everybody's got less touches. <laughs> so if everybody's got yeah. less touches, efficiency all of a sudden should become valued more. Look, yep. guys, I'm telling you right now, even if they don't get LaShawn McCoy or Devonta, Devonta Freeman, if they go out and they get Doug Martin or Alfred Morris, Miles Sanders still isn't touching the ball 16 well, those, times a game. Well, those guys are dead, so I don't... Yeah, I understand they're dead, but Doug Peterson doesn't care. But Doug He's Peterson never, also didn't he is have never going to have a young workhorse running back. back of this nature. Like we've we've gone through the closest thing we saw was Ryan Matthews, and Ryan Matthews was towards the end of his career too. I was going to say, but yeah, he, I mean, and he had some fumble issues. We had Jay Ajayi in efficient. this mix. We had, yeah. like, I mean, I'm trying to remember some of the guys. That, Jay Ajayi's, yeah. I'm just saying, like, I'm trying yeah. to just remember the names, Blunt. and none of these like guys. Garrett Blunt. Uh, like Garrett Blunt, Jordan Howard, yeah, those were the Blunt other ones. Was, like, I, there's, I mean, talk about yeah, the very but end. They're power backs. Yeah. Those are power backs. That's like Miles Sanders is a legit superstar. He's but, great. The offensive line is great. But what is his upside if he only gets, you know, 290 touches? Well, 290 touches is quite a bit. I mean, that's quite a bit, but he's not going to be the RB1, 1, 2, or 3. Yeah, Everyone I, thinks I, he I, can be that. that RB1, 2, or 3. You know who can be? I'll say this, okay? So we can have a different name out there instead of just Kenyon Drake. Joe Mixon right now is going as RB7. Wouldn't shock me at all if he finished the year as the number one running back. The offense really needs to take a step forward for that to happen, to have some more scoring to. opportunities. And I, I, I'm i not saying it's not possible because Mixon is a true three-down back. He's elite in terms of talent. Uh, the offense is going to be completely underrated. I think we all agree on that. Yeah. Um, but, again, you have to have him more involved in the passing game for him to get there. And he hasn't been I agree. Been and he, he can be. It's just a matter of whether or not for they sure. flip on that switch. I would say oh, I would say his ceiling is fourth overall. Mixon? Yeah. Fourth overall running back? Yeah. Like I think that's – like I could see wow. that. You know, I mean, I'm I'm not going to put him with Saquon and Elliott and McCaffrey just because those guys are the, you know, just incredible focal points of their offenses to just like sure. the nth degree. But I think yeah. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know about one overall. I think that's a hot take, but I don't think it's a hot take to say fourth like that. That's very reasonable. If like Mike saying, if everybody, <clears throat> you know, kind of gets on board there and also the defense stinks, which means the offense is going to be continuously yeah. on the field. Yep. That's a good thing for fantasy. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have so much Joe Mixon this year. I'm taking him over Derrick Henry. I think, well, I think it depends on where you're drafting. Cause if you land at number six overall in your draft, you're not getting Mixon. If you like, if you land, let's, let's be realistic. If you land at number eight in your draft, anywhere one through eight, you're not going to get Mixon because you have to take him at that number eight pick and someone will take him between nine and 12 or 12 back down to nine. Why would I not uh, take so- him at the eight pick? You I'm taking him, him over the- Henry. I'm taking him over any wide receiver not named Michael Thomas. Oh, okay. So that's I didn't know you'd do that. Like I, I didn't know I, I wouldn't take him over Devonte Adams. Uh, Julio Jones is probably a guy that I might take <clears> over <throat> Joe Mixon. Yeah, but yeah, yeah I take him. I mean, his ADP right now is 11. In the full point yeah, PPR, I would still right. take. I would still take Julio too. But I, I don't know if you're getting into the halves. That's where I start to. It's, it's close getting closer. Sure. I think it's getting closer. And yeah. I think I think this year you can look at that wide receiving group there. And the wide receivers that kind of slip into that second and third round and go, okay, well, let me get Mixon and solidify that. Because then you start to get a little dicey with the chubs of the world. It's like, okay, well, what's with him and Kareem Hunt? And how's that going to work? And, right. You know, so Mixon's kind of like one of those last standalone guys with Henry where you can, you know, get your guy, quote unquote. Right. Yeah. Let's go top 60, outside the top 60 for running backs, guys who could break out. I'm not saying become an RB1, but someone along those lines. Yeah, I'm going to let Joe go first in this one. <laughs> All right, well, look. I'll let him go. I, I, I'm not giving up on this guy yet like everybody else seems to want to, and it's Devin Singletary. And and I've seen him mm. kind of – that's fine. We could fight about this. Um, we, we've gone – see, we all agreed. Now we're all fighting. See, now everything's back to normal. Thank goodness. To normal? There we go. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, it's about efficiency again, right? And, I mean, that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. I know he only scored four touchdowns last year. I get the touchdowns are a problem. 
But in the same time, he, you know, with everything going on, he still almost finished as a fantasy RB2 despite missing all that time, despite having almost no touchdowns there. Um, I, I, I'm aware of Zach Moss. I get it. But I think this is going to be a very difficult year with everything going on for rookie running backs to get out of the gate with just explosive and fantastic and takeaway jobs. And Devin Singletary was a guy that I think when you watched him play last year, he made the most of the opportunities he got early on. I remember that week one game against the Jets where they hardly gave him a ball. And then all of a sudden the fourth quarter, he's running like crazy and he just completely changed that game and brought Buffalo back into that game. And it was incredible to watch. And I got very excited. I was like, wow, this is really something. Uh, and then, of course, the injury happened. But look, Frank Gore's not there anymore. I think in terms of being highly efficient and, and catching passes as well. And, and look, Moss has been injured in his career, too. So there's no, like, lock on him. Mm-hmm. So I think the ceiling is high for Singletary. And I think the, the point is the the stock is low. When the ceiling is high and the stock is low, I always think that's a good combination. If it's wrong, it's not going to crush you. So first, Joe, you cheated. He's He's going 53 overall. Oh, and, I'm sorry. You know what? In the and, original and, thing, where I was looking at before you told me to change it, he was 68. Uh-huh. I think. Uh-huh. Well, I'm All seeing I'm seeing him 63 but, in ECR, 63, because the quick. experts are lower on Singletary than the general public, which is usually a bad sign. I'll give you yeah, another one quick. after if you want. Go ahead. But hold on. Okay. Here, here. <laughs> I want to I want to explain the reason that, that I'm down on Singletary, and I do like Zach Moss for what it's worth. I like him as a player. I think he's fantastic. He reminds me a lot of Kareem Hunt. However, I'm not going to say that he's going to be the number one back. They're going to use him in the Frank Gore role. Gore averaged up and through week 12. I think Frank Gore averaged 12 carries per game. He was getting the goal line work. Josh Allen steals goal he line does. work. Here's here's a fun fact. I was on a Buffalo radio station yesterday, that, and uh, we were talking about Devin Singletary and Zach Moss, and I said uh, Moss is walking into that Gore, g- the Frank Gore role. They've already talked about the fact that they're, they're bringing him in to take those goal line carries. He's going to do the short yardage work, and that is a very valuable role, and we saw it with Frank mm-hmm. Gore last year. He ranked he ranked 12th in the NFL among running backs with, red zone, uh, with carries inside the five-yard line. Devin Singletary had two carries from inside the five yard line, and those hosts out there in Buffalo, they knew exactly when they happened. There was a game against Washington, and they said it was in the same game that he got him, and it was a blowout win. It didn't even matter. They do not trust Devin Singletary and his juke style on the goal line. They want a bruiser, and that's why they drafted. When you draft a running back in the third round, you clearly have a purpose. You have a role for him, especially for a team that has a great defense, uh, one that wants to run the football. Singletary is going to be fine, but the fact of the matter, he doesn't get the the carries when they matter most. Here's what I have for you. A carry outside the red zone is worth point. uh, It's 0.64 fantasy points. That's what they're on average. They are worth a carry inside the five yard line on average is worth 2.09 fantasy points. So if he's not getting those carries when they're worth four times as much, it doesn't matter. He's basically a low upside running back. He's going to be safe. I do believe that he's going to live up and, and finish with that low end RB2, those RB2 numbers. But I don't think he has upside to be a breakout star where he's going to be a top 12 running back because Agree, exactly. he just doesn't score the touchdowns. Well, and that's fair. I think he's a the, quality the only pick. point I'm, I'm going to make about that in some of those yeah. stats is you have to be on the field to get those opportunities. And yeah. that is the one thing he missed a significant chunk of time. So you're not wrong in what you're saying that's that's absolute right. fact the thing we don't know and again I'm I'm rolling the dice here a little bit is yeah maybe Zach Moss is that guy but if he puts the ball on, on the floor once or twice in a preseason that's going to change the dynamic quite a bit very quickly and also what are these guys going to be doing and how will they pick up playbooks without OTAs and without the normal amount of practice or what how how that basically affects the first half of the season I'm trying to get off to a six and two start, not a two and six start, and that's that's what I'm looking to do. And I and I kind of feel the same way. Like I I acquired Miles Sanders last year in almost every league in the trade deadline, and it was a very good thing that I did because he had a very good second half. And I think a lot of these yeah. rookies, I would rather acquire. The, I'll give you a name outside of two that I've got a close eye on, even though he is a rookie, just because I think it's a wide open situation as Cam Akers, just because. I'm not sold on anybody there, so I'm not saying a I'm star. especially not sold on the offensive line. Though. I'm Well, I mean, that's fair, but, like, somebody's got to carry the football there, and I don't know who it's going to be, right. and right now, according to this, he's in the 80s, and I'm actually surprised he's 81 uh, on this on this uh, sheet right here. So that's another yeah. guy that I would look at and I'd say, look, just for sheer volume, potentially, that could be a guy as well that could break out. And I want to say break out. I don't know if he's going to become an RB1 but, you know, I think he could go well, you know, in terms of outperforming ADP. And I think that's what we're looking at. When sure. I consider breakout, that's what I think of. Okay. Tags, we're going to get to yours in just a second. First, though, I want to tell you guys we've got two giveaways going on right now. We're giving away a Fielder's Choice wallet. That's a vintage. Uh, it's made out of a vintage baseball glove. 
Um, you guys are going to absolutely love this wall. I got one for my dad for Father's Day. And we're also giving away a full-sized DeAndre Hopkins Cardinals helmet. If he helped you win your fantasy league, or if you're a Cardinals fan who's super pumped uh, to have him with your team now, or if you just enjoy listening to the show, uh, you know, submit an entry for this contest. What you have to do is you have to go to Stitcher or Apple Podcasts, uh, leave a review, take a screenshot of that review, and send it to us at contest at fantasypros.com. And if you want to check out the details, it's at fantasypros.com slash contest. All right, Tags, who do you have for us? Don't steal my guy. I, I, I was actually thinking about stealing your guy because I know exactly who it is. <laughs> of uh, course you do. I'm going to skip over him. But I'm do you like him? Out- you, you would consider saying him? Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for a breakout, because the thing is, the truth of the matter is, when you're looking outside the top 60, the odds are really stacked against you to find a running back, because we know the guys that are going to get opportunity. We, like, yeah, like unless back, an injury. Like, four of these guys are going to break out because of an injury, correct. but you can't predict that. Exactly. We can't predict injuries, right? So you're looking for guys that could do it without injury, and there's two guys that jump to the top of my list uh, that could do it without injury, and uh, one is your guy, the other one is Ronald Jones. Uh, Ronald yeah, Jones is a, guy, is a guy that, you know, with Tom Brady coming to town, that offense is going to move a bit smoother. Uh, Bruce Arians showed last year that he can kind of adapt to whoever his quarterback is and their play style. Ronald Jones, I think people forget towards the end of last year, I remember watching the team and thinking, like, he's he was playing fantastic at the end of the year, and I understand that Bruce Arians never fully trusted him that he was in and out of the lineup. He was mixing carries with Peyton Barber, but don't think that he's all of a sudden going to trust some rookie coming in that he drafted in the third round that he wasn't particularly excited about uh, in, in Keyshawn Vaughn. Keyshawn Vaughn, I don't know where the reputation came from where, where all of a sudden people are saying that he is a guy that catches a ton of passes. I really don't. I mean, when people were, were it was almost like you, you would think he was James White with the way that people were talking about Keyshawn Vaughn as a pass catcher. He's not. He's very similar to Ronald he's Jones in a lot of, of ways. There. Yeah, the, yeah, he's he's Jones 2.0. There, I don't know. Oh there's nothing <laughs> exceptional about what he does. I didn't like Keyshawn Vaughn in the scouting process. I think Ronald Jones is going to be just fine. That offensive line has been upgraded a ton, and I do believe that Bruce Arians wants to give his veteran opportunity to win that job and Ronald Jones I think can win that job I think he's a good enough running back to get it done I'm not saying he's elite but when you play for an offense that's going to be top 12 in scoring there's some going to be some opportunity there for you yeah. now again there's a reason he's going as late as he is in drafts because there's some uncertainty around him and Keyshawn Vaughn the role but I do believe that this is Ronald Jones it's his job to start the year well, I can tell you, as Mr. Patriot, Keyshawn Vaughn sorry go no ahead. I was gonna say as Mr. Patriot I could tell you if they don't find somebody to do that role in some way, because, you know, so much Brady efficiency the last couple of years was him running, you know, run play action, you know, and, and I, they run that power yeah. eye and they run everything through there. And, you know, when Devlin went down last year, so so too went the offense. They could not run the ball anymore. And when they couldn't run the ball anymore because Devlin was out and they run that fullback system and they like to run out of that power eye. And next thing you know, the offense went in the tank. And next thing you know, Brady stats went in the tank and everything fell apart for that offense and for that team collectively. And if they don't figure out how to do that in some fashion of it, because that's the running game has really propped up Brady the last couple of years. I'm not taking anything away from Brady. He's the GOAT. But at the same time, you have to recognize where he is in his career. And that was a very big part right. of his ability to be the passer he was the last three seasons because of how good of a job the Patriots did of setting up the run and then running play action. And if they can't do that, I think Mm -hmm. people might not realize that Tampa might struggle a little bit more than people realize. I really thought, so there's rumors for what it's worth. There's rumors out there that the Bucs are interested in Devonta Freeman, which makes a ton of sense, I guess, Uh, which tells you that they're not particularly high on either Vaughn or Ronald Jones. That would be an interesting Uh, fit. He also called the football very well last year for Atlanta. Exactly. He's he's a better pass catcher than kind of guy you need in that or Kevin Falk kind of guy, Deion Lewis kind of guy. (laughs) I really thought that they were going to sign Deion Lewis as soon as he was let go by the Titans because I was like, Deion Lewis has experience with Tom Brady. He obviously had his best career year with Tom Brady. Why don't we just bring back everybody? Let's get Troy Brown and dust him off. Why don't we just get everybody? (laughs) Randy Randy Moss? Why not? Randy Randy can still play, right? (laughs) (laughs) Coming from a Keyshawn Vaughn guy, I'm still going to have a lot of shares of Ronald Jones just because I want exposure to this offense, and you're getting it for super cheap. Whoever the starting running back is, he's going to be good. He's going to be a high-end RB2. Uh, and I think that it's probably going to be Ronald Jones from the start of the season. So I want some shares. Now, Tags, tell me who your guy, who, who my guy is. Raheem Mostert. No, dude, just Kareem Hunt. I'm just really? kidding. It's Raheem Mostert. Yeah, I, I, do li- I do like Kareem Hunt. I think that even with Nick Chubb there, Kareem Hunt can be very good. He outproduced Nick Chubb from the time he came back last year. And so I'm not drafting any Nick Chubb. I will draft a lot of Kareem Hunt. 
but it's definitely Raheem Mostert. Ever since he took over as the lead back in San Francisco's backfield, he was the man. He was a top three fantasy football running back. Now, this is including the three games in the playoffs where he absolutely went off too, but he was a stud for eight consecutive weeks, guys. He was a stud, uh, unpredictable stud, though. Uh, that's the that's, that's the issue with it, right? Uh, Matt Breida is gone, which clears up a lot of that uncertainty. You still you do have Jarek McKinnon coming back, who the 49ers, for whatever reason, have held on to Jarek McKinnon this entire time. <laughs> he like, has I, new I, photos I legit, of somebody it, somewhere. Apparently, he might. Yeah. I mean, Kyle Shanahan's a, he's, he's a good dude. He's a young dude, but you don't know what he's doing. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, Raheem Mostert is a guy like Ronald Jones, and the fact that he, I, th- I do think that he has a this this lead role. I think that as the season went on, we saw that the 49ers and Shanahan understand that Tevin Coleman is not a workhorse. He's a, he's best suited as a complimentary guy. But you have McKinnon coming back, who's going to steal some work in the passing game. You have Jeffrey Wilson, who you know is going to steal like three touchdowns in one game. Uh, you you have Kyle Uzcheck, who's still part of the offense. So there's. There's a lot of parts in this offense, but fortunately, there's a lot of volume here. So Raheem Mostert is a guy that I I put on my list because I do think there's a chance he breaks out if Shanahan changes things. But we ha- we can't forget, guys. Raheem Mostert, he's no spring chicken. He's not young. He's been in the league for a while now. He doesn't Kyle have Shanahan. miles on his legs, though. Well, that no, no, that's true. But what I'm saying is, like, why hasn't he been used? Like, what's there's the reason, reason that there's always a reason? There has to be a well, reason. He also right? only and had like, one one game in the regular season, at least, where he had 15 carries. Or more, I yeah. And that that's the one that that's the big, like you got to get fifteen to eight. Like even Miles Sanders, like I expect between fifteen and eighteen on a regular basis, right? Like, that's what mm-hmm. I expect. I don't expect twenty five. That's nuts. So that's like Derrick Henry season yeah. territory. But like that's that's my thing with with Mostert and their their weird commitment to everybody else is always the thing that holds me up. And I agree. I think Mostert showed you in the playoffs. Like he deserves the shot to be that guy. I'm just not sold that he's going to be that guy, and I, you know, I hate this. I don't want to put this one-year wonder tag on him, but right. it just feels way more C.J. Anderson than it does like. Well, C.J. Guy, Anderson guy was being like, drafted in the first round. We're not the Black Book that year. Seven. Not the, I took We're getting him in the so seventh. much crap that year. Oh my god, people added me all. Some over people the place. were drafting him like third overall. You're man. so yeah. stupid. Why did you put C.J. Anderson in the first round? How can you do it? I'm like, well, dude, like because he's he hasn't proven it. Honestly, like he just hasn't. And I was a guy who sure. picked him up and had him everywhere, and I still and didn't. Yeah, you're him picking there. Kenyon Drake, well, who's like the same. But I've as seen Anderson, Kenyon right? Drake be good for years. But I've seen years of Kenyon Drake be used well. I mean, play well and not be used properly. That's the difference. The difference is we haven't seen most hurt because why? That's the question mark, and I think that's what Mike's alluding Because he to. had no draft capital, and finally when he got his opportunity Adam Thielen didn't around. have any draft capital. He moved pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, well, let me ask you a couple questions, okay? What do you think the odds are that Raheem Mostert's in that role? In what, the lead back role? Yeah. Well, he's going to be yeah, the lead back. The, lead the question guy. is, does he get does he get those 15 okay, carries? Okay, so what, what are the odds that he gets those 15 carries? I would put it those odds at thirty percent. Thirty percent. Okay, go if he gets than that, I was going to go fifty. But fifty. Okay, so we'll say <laughs> we'll split the difference and say forty. If he gets those fifteen carries, is he an RB one in Kyle Shanahan's offense? If he gets what uh, what carries? Fifteen carries. Fifteen carries a game. Is he involved in the passing game? Because he had twenty two targets all last season. He's not especially involved. No. Same same as last um, year, just you know what he did over the final eight. So fifteen weeks. carries. You're looking at two hundred and forty carries in the season. It's kind of like Jonathan Taylor. Most Taylor's efficient career. running back in football. I think you're looking. I think you'd be looking at. Well, uh, yeah. I think you'd be looking at a middling RB two. Maybe he played sixty percent of snaps. Maybe. By the way, in two of sixteen games, I'm just throwing that out there too. That's what I'm saying. That's why right. I, I don't believe. And like he's been crazy efficient. You go back and to 2018. Good. He averaged seven point seven yards per carry in 2018. So he was good then. Yeah. It wasn't a bit, as big a sample size, but um, yeah, I, I like Raheem Mostert as a player. But I, for whatever reason, it's one of those things where it's like we wondered why Kenyon Drake wasn't getting a bigger role uh, in Miami, no matter who the coach was. And it's like then he goes to Arizona and then he gets all the opportunity. I don't know if Shanahan found a hidden gem. I don't know if he realized in the playoffs. I don't know if he thought, oh, you know what? I got this running back that's extremely fresh. He's on a roll. We're going to ride him. The first bad game, does he go back to Tevin Coleman and, and, and create some nasty timeshare where you really can't trust him? I mean, looking at the game logs, man, I mean, 10 and 11, 11 carries or less in, I think, all but five games, that's that's not good. Especially I, when a guy doesn't catch passes because it just gives you a very, very low floor. Don't just look at the game logs, man. Look at the postseason as well. 
Oh, no, no. I know the postseason, but that's it's an extremely small sample size. You know what I mean? It's like it's like those people that wanted to draft Robert Foster as a top 30 wide receiver last year because sure. he finished the year. And Brashad Perriman, obviously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Brashad Perriman was like the number two fantasy wide receiver during the fantasy playoffs. Does that mean I'm going to draft him? No. It, it, it's, a, it's a small sample size. You know, I'm glad size. you brought that up. That, I, that I am those, drafting Brashad Perriman, by the way. That's one of those uh, you know analytical moments, too, where – the thought process was also good because that the 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 workload became John Brown, <laughs> like like the theoretical of okay, wh- what are we targeting? What are we looking for? It wasn't Foster. It was ended up being John Brown in that. In because John Brown's a good receiver a good, and Robert Foster was right, not. But I mean, Foster that was all point is <laughs> oh, absolutely. But whether you're good or not, you know, to a certain right. extent, the number one on even a bad team sometimes is going to be useful to you in fantasy, and that's that was the one yeah. thing that people were but, looking at. But defining yeah. it is more important than just being aware of it. But the bottom line here, Bobby, it's it's good that you brought him up because Raheem Mostert is definitely someone that belongs in this list as someone. And the reason that he's going outside the top 60 overall is because of those mm-hmm. risks. So I, I have no issue with him being on this I list. I like that we all hammered each other on the guys outside that we like. That's great. That's that's yeah. healthy. We got to yeah, do absolutely. that, right? We have to vet each other's thing. And look, this is the point, right? Good conversation, good debate. Everybody's, you know, yep. everybody made their choices for reasons and, and everybody – has to listen to all the reasons of why these guys were all dangerous. Like all three of the guys that we we picked, everybody yeah. else was like, "Well, I don't know," but you got to think about that, and that's why they're going outside yeah. the top fifty. <laughs> now, Bobby, you, we gotta wait, let's get Bobby the first one. This yeah, next one, Bobby, we're gonna do, Bobby we're gonna do first one. We're gonna do the breakout wide receiver inside the top sixty picks. Yeah. So these guys are obviously all going to be like they're going to be fantasy relevant wide receivers. But we're looking for a guy that can truly break out, finishes a top twelve fantasy wide receiver. That maybe you're getting him in the fifth round, Bobby. Who's your guy? Well, I've got three of them, and <laughs> I was hoping that you guys would help narrow the list for me because I'm not exactly sure who to pick. So we're looking for this year's version of Chris Godwin, right? Yeah. I'm sorry, Tags. I'm taking your guy. You're a piece of crap. But uh, I hope it's not mine. Too. It's 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 my number one, <laughs> and I'm also speaking for Kyle Yates because he really yeah. helped talk me into. No, this. we're all on this board is on this, this one. is who you want. Okay, you go ahead and take this one. I'll go with a different no, one. No, Tags. no, no. Go ahead. No, I got no, I got three like on my list. My mother, you got three on your Fight over a check when I was seriously a kid. just take it. I, I gave you the first one. Take it. It's easy. All right. Well, it's obviously Calvin Ridley. Oh, well, that's yep. mine, too. So there we go. <laughs> just, hey. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening to Fantasy Pros. It's been a fun show for you today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a whole lot of reasons to like Calvin Ridley. Bobby, uh, Bobby, why do you think that Calvin Ridley has a potential to be a wide receiver one? Because there's a lot of people out there. I'm going to try and give the, the opposite point of view because there's people listening saying, oh, come on. Julio You're going to try to there, fight Bobby. Calvin Ridley. I don't think you can do it, man. Well, I'm going to give you I'm going to say that Julio Jones is there. Julio Jones has been there and Julio Jones will continue to be the wide receiver one. Why how is it that Calvin Ridley can break out if he didn't already last year? You know what's really sad is I was going to look up this grand statistic on just how incredibly efficient Calvin Ridley had Calvin Ridley was and yep. uh, play index on pro football uh, pro football reference is down right now. So, I can't give you that exact number, but well, I, Calvin I Ridley was among numbers. the top 5 most efficient wide receivers in football and he mm-hmm. didn't get all that many targets. And now he's going to get all those targets because how many targets are gone? Just an absolute ton. Yeah, Julio Jones is going to get some of those, but Austin Hooper leaves. I get it. Hayden Hurst comes in. He's not Austin Hooper. No. Devontae, Par- Devontae Freeman leaves. Uh, he he's was better great than Austin in Hooper. Game. What's that? You think he's better than Austin Hooper? Really? I think Hayden Hurst is actually more talented than Austin Hooper. Oh, I'm not saying I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying he's going to get those targets that's right away. I'm, I'm not saying that. that. Well, I guess maybe that's what I'm I'm alluding to. Is like yeah. I don't think I don't think he's but going to you. usurp that role. And that's you know when uh, very rarely do I like to do the addition by subtraction. But in this yeah. instance, when you're talking about a guy in 29 career games who has 17 touchdowns, we're talking about a guy who has shown you yeah, glimpses buddy. of taking over games. So even his rookie year, there were a couple yeah. games Calvin Ridley had mm-hmm. where. We were just like, whoa, whoa, look at that. <laughs> like, that is incredible. Yep. And sometimes, you know, it's difficult for a guy, you know, early on in his career when you're playing next to a Hall of Famer necessarily to kind of eat into that workload. But I think as another year passes of Julio Jones, and I am not down on Julio Jones at all, I just feel right. like this is a ready to take that next step and, and move forward here. Yeah. And I think Ridley, you know, I'm looking at him and I know Matt Ryan was hurt a little bit last year, too. And I think that might have a little bit to do with some of the numbers not being exactly where you wanted them with Calvin Ridley. But when all said and done, like this is year three. And I think Calvin Ridley is ready to become a superstar in this league. Like, you remember when Juju Smith-Schuster was extraordinarily efficient as a rookie? <laughs> he only had 79 targets, but mm-hmm. uh, he made the best of them. And he was he finished as a wide receiver, too. And then the next year, he totally broke out. Calvin Ridley, 92 targets, wide receiver, two. 93 targets, wide receiver, two. 
He's getting 120 this 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 season. And if he gets yeah. 120, is one of the most efficient wide receivers in football. And when you watch him on tape, one of the best 12 or 15 wide receivers in football in terms of talent. He's going to be maybe a low-end wide receiver one, guys. Well, look, in, in his yeah, final I mean, six games, he averaged 17.1 PPR points per game. So that tells you when that run happened with the Falcons. Once Sanu went, once Sanu went out, yeah, when that's Sanu who he was. was gone, right? That was the other. That's the other piece too. Like Sanu's yep. gone, Hooper's gone. So when those guys were out, he did respond, and that was when Ryan was healthy, and when this team played much better. They were as good as they were in the second half, as as bad as they were in the first. They were atrocious. But you know, Ridley showed you in those last six weeks of oh wow, okay, he is ready. And I think part of the reason to let those guys walk is because the organization realizes, look, this guy's ready to fill these bigger shoes, so let's go with that. Let's right. be more efficient. Let's turn around and spend cap money elsewhere, and let's improve the defense, and maybe we can find someone who wants to tackle somebody on the Falcons for once this year. Tags, yep. honestly, in terms of talent, which duo is better, Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley or Mike Evans and Chris Godwin? I've already had this debate on Twitter. I put it up to a poll. and Have you? Uh, Okay. Yeah, and for whatever reason, I lost that poll. Uh, I take Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley any day of the week. I agree. I don't know what people are thinking. Chris Godwin's extremely talented, and he's broken out, and that's why people want to want to want to gravitate towards him. But I promise you, if Calvin Ridley had the the target opportunity that Chris Godwin had, he would do just as much. I promise you that. And Julio Jones is obviously better than Mike Evans. So. Uh, I, I'm with you on this one, Bobby. I was just trying to give you the opposite take and just trying to, sure. to argue with you a little bit because uh, some people have told me that if, if Julio Jones were to get hurt, uh, Calvin Ridley would see double coverage. Well, Calvin Ridley <laughs> does see co- double coverage yeah. now. He actually gets bracketed like a little bit in college um, because Julio Jones – Julio Jones gets a lot of number one cornerbacks, and they trust those guys in man to man coverage. But losing Muhammad Sanu is massive for this offense. Obviously, Austin Hooper had a big role. Uh, Hayden Hurst, I do anticipate him coming in and taking a lot of targets. But I have Hayden Hurst projected for 86 targets, so it's not quite getting up to Austin Hooper territory. Calvin Ridley, my projections came in at 118 targets. Yep. And depending on if I give him seven or eight touchdowns, he ranges from either the wide receiver nine or wide receiver 13 this year. So I am 100% in on Calvin Ridley. He's being undervalued. He is a potential breakout star, and if something did happen to Julio Jones, he would just be a target monster, and Calvin Ridley would win fantasy R- championship. Ridley's a touchdown machine, man. He's 17 he touchdowns 17 on touchdowns. 185 yeah, totally. targets. 17 touchdowns in 29 games. Like that's It's insane. You know, and, and, and part of that is because of, of the attention Julio, Julio. gets, and he's open yep. to the reds, and that's, and that's fine by me. <laughs> like, sign yep. me up. Yeah. Yep. Where's, the, where's, the, where's the note? Where can I sign that? And I can sign the contract to get that on my team. I'm good with that. Yep, and if Julio f- f- did go down, now those touchdown numbers would decrease. I do believe that, but the volume would exactly. come up to help make up exactly. for that. Exactly. You're in PPR. Yep. You're you're. It's a push almost, almost not yep. quite, but almost. So tags. I also thought about saying DJ Chark and Terry McLaurin. Who were your other names that you were considering? I like that you bring them up already. Like you don't even give me a chance to say my guys. Uh, <laughs> Chark was uh, one of the guys on my list. I had three guys down. Chark was one of those guys, but he was the last one. Number two, uh, DK Metcalf. DK Metcalf is being drafted just inside the top 60, so I even went towards the bottom of this list and said, you know what, you want a guy that's tied to a, a, a obviously a top tier quarterback because you, you like if they're being drafted outside the top three or four rounds, these are guys that are not guaranteed 120 targets. DK Metcalf, I think you could s- safely say that he's going to get 100 targets, maybe might get up to that 115 range. Fortunately for him, uh, Russell Wilson completes like you know sometimes 70 percent of his passes to his wide receivers, which yeah. is kind of ridiculous. Um, but Russell Wilson has asked uh, to throw the ball more. This defense is worse than it's ever been. Uh, they continue to lose players, and uh, Jadavian Clowney, we don't know what's going on him. He hasn't signed with anybody yet but i anticipate him being gone from that defense the the cornerback quentin dunbar that they just signed in free agency he's in trouble with the law i would appear i i don't i don't think he's gonna be playing football anytime soon so this defense is going to be crap so therefore russell wilson is going to be asked to throw the ball more dk metcalf is a guy that when he came into the nfl he was considered raw and i'm putting that in quotes because so many people talked about his combine and said oh he's fast but he's stiff as hell he can't run a route I'm like, okay, guys, keep talking, keep talking. And they did, and DK Metcalf kept falling in rookie drafts, and, and, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, DK Metcalf is a physical specimen tied to Russell Wilson, and he has magnets for hands. DK Metcalf can, like, break fantasy football. Like, legitimately has top five wide receiver upside if he were to get those he targets. Now, imagine, Bryant, right? imagine for See, a second say, that Tyler Lockett... He either becomes Anquan Bolden or because David Boston. Like, he's going to become one of those two. I don't know which, but he's going to be one of those two guys. It, he has a Calvin Johnson type he, he upside. Does. Oh, like, that's no, like, Tags. Like, he, no, 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 no. I oh, said, has, Tags, you're the hot take guy. Wait, hold on a second. Upside, oh, sure, are, why not? If he, if he, no, he doesn't have Calvin Johnson upside? Are you kidding me? 
Nobody has Calvin Johnson upside. Every, yes, yes. Everyone yes. does. Not, <laughs> every, everyone. not everyone. Not everyone. <laughs> Except not, you. No. <laughs> but when you, but when you're as big and uh, when you're a physical specimen like Metcalf, yes, it's possible. Now, <clears throat> I would never say that Calvin Johnson could have been an All Pro running back, man. No, he couldn't have. He was incredible in space. Incredible. He was an incredible <sighs> route runner, and he had all of DK Metcalf's Calvin was abilities. was special. But DK, and that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying DK Metcalf's Calvin Johnson. Don't get it twisted. Okay. I'm saying I was trying DK to Metcalf. twist. Don't make this yeah. tawdry. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like you mean to tell me that DK Metcalf can't be better than Kenny Galladay? Uh, he can, and he might. Yeah, be I think this year. I think he could be a better version of Kenny Galladay. That's a good way to put no, it. But I, I'm not going to have any shares of DK Metcalf. He's going ahead of Keenan Allen. Well, I was agreeing with Mike in terms of like this physical presence. Yeah, he the upside physical presence of uh, like yeah. terrifying is is like yeah. Calvin Johnson, yeah. where you're just terrified of that guy. It's a good name. He's got to catch you know the ball more. You know. <laughs> just well, period. They, they have to pass the ball more than you know four times that's a game. true too that's true too there's, there's a lot of things if they do though weird. i agree tags he does have a ton of upside and you know what he if he a, has a great a little season this will me. finally be the year where russell wilson gets a real mvp look he should have already i, I he's not disagree best, he's with the you the best player in football he's better wilson, than lamar jackson he's better than patrick mahomes russell wilson's the best player in football already i don't want to go that far <laughs> I'll take him. I would take it. If I you take it. Patrick, Patrick Mahomes and Russell Wilson, there, if you put Russell Wilson in the Chiefs offense, he's better than Patrick Mahomes. Nope. Yeah, I don't know. I, no, I, I'm not willing to say it. I, have, I don't see any. Patrick Mahomes does things I've never seen a human being do before. Yeah. On football after so after one Wilson. year, I was not willing to buy all in on the, the Patrick Mahomes saying he's the GOAT and all this and that. Uh, but now that I've seen it <laughs> see, like, I was. consistently. He's amazing, I'm Mr. He's so good. He's, like, he's kind of ridiculous. I, I kind of pride myself on the He was almost thing. as efficient as Ryan Tannehill last year. Patrick Mahomes, <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you said DK Metcalf. I love the upside. I agree. I don't. Oh. I won't have any shares because he's going ahead of Keenan Allen. Joe, who's your other guy? Uh, well, Ridley was my number one with you know, and then there was a big drop off from two. But this was a guy that okay. I owned everywhere last year, and I'm going to probably own him again this year. And it's Cortland Sutton. Um, look. Here, oh no, Tags is going to beat fine. you he up, dude. Up. Hundred. He can beat me up. You know what? <laughs> I won a lot of leagues last year with a wide receiving core built of Chris Godwin, Cortland Sutton, and Cooper Cup because all three Ooh, of those nice. guys. And I mean, like, I just described pretty much 75% of my teams. Like, I had the combination of those three guys or at least two of the three. And I, I understand, like, it's not perfect. I get that. Like, that's what we're not looking for. But, uh, you know, 124 targets, and he played mostly with Joe Flacco, who was just pathetic. And I'm not saying Drew Locke is Patrick Mahomes, because he's not. But I do think He could they, be a lot better than Flacco. What I'm saying is he's better than Flacco, I think. And number two... I think you're also setting him up in a situation where it's almost, and I keep using this phrase with him, too big to fail. You have all these, you have Lindsay, you have Gordon, you have Judy, you have Cortland Sutton, you have Fant, you have all these guys there. And like, yeah. if he sucks, man, that's on you. Like you've got a lot of, a lot of pieces here to make it work. He had six touchdowns. Everybody gave up on him when, you know, when, when Drew Locke took over and he was pretty good when Drew Locke took over. I'm saying is the volumes there. I think Judy might be the better talent, but at the same time, I have to have some sort of tempered expectations, at least for one more year in 2020, that all these rookies, especially the wide receivers, can get out there and just completely dominate right out of the gate because we are not in a normal offseason, and I think that matters, and I think it's going to show itself in the first six weeks of the season, so I'm sticking to that. But again, Ridley was my number one by far, but if I had to pick another guy that I'm still in love with in this range of the later range towards 60, it would be Sutton. Go ahead. Sure. So Pound it's really tags. interesting. T Tags and I do not like Cortland Sutton. Did you like him last, year? Oh, last year? He was pretty good last year. I, 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 I did like Cortland okay. Sutton last year, but the, pro <laughs> the problem is all the competition for targets, I don't think his upside is really there because of that. See, I like the competition because um, I think that's finally going to free him up a little bit more, too. Like, there's a lot more very guys. Well could, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking the opposite of everybody else. Like, oh, well, there's so much competition for targets. Oh, okay, so maybe the targets go from 120-something to 115, but... Yeah. Maybe he catches 80-something balls or 90 balls out of that instead of the 72 because there's so many other guys on the field you have to worry about now, and you didn't have to worry yeah. about that last year for the most part. What I was going to say is his ECR is way above his ADP, so the experts in the industry tend to be with you, Joe, uh, as opposed to Tags and I. Tags, why don't you make the uh, ahead, opposing point? counter though? me. I mean, 
I mean, no, no, he ranked 19th or 15th in the league in targets last year. He he finished 19th in fantasy scoring, and that's despite coming down with a lot of questionable 50 50 okay. balls that a lot of receivers wouldn't and, have. And More coming sudden, down with a bad case he, of Joe Flacco for having well, a Well, yeah, he balled he, he's out. He's a lot dude. like Alshon Jeffrey. I think he's a quality <laughs> he receiver. I just I'm not love kidding. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Corlin Sutton was fantastic last year as a player. Yeah. Now, I don't, I, I'm not, but my issue is that Drew Locke is not going to come out and throw 30 touchdowns. And when you add in Jerry Judy, a guy that's going to command targets, Jerry Judy is the better talent uh-huh. in terms of Agreed. what he can do to get separation Corlin Sutton is still a magnet uh in terms of like what he's going to do in the red zone but again if Drew Locke is only throwing 22 touchdowns where are these touchdowns going he has Noah Fant a guy that's going to be coming into his second year flashed a little bit rookie year they went out and they, they drafted Albert O which is Drew Locke's favorite guy from college the touchdown his his basically favorite target in the red zone that could take a little looks away they have Melvin Gordon who's been fantastic on the goal mm-hmm. line throughout his career he's been like one of the best goal line running backs in football they still have Philip Lindsay the, it, KJ Hamler was someone that they drafted to take place in the slot I'm guessing of Deshaun Hamilton so it's like you look at all these miles and it's like he He's for sure not getting up to 125 targets because this is a, right. this is still a Vic Fangio team. Uh, it <laughs> does now. help that Pat Shermer. <laughs> Right, but it, it does help that Pat Shermer came there, but Shermer, what he has done throughout his career, he's actually amplified like slot receivers. He's mm-hmm. done really good for them. So KJ Hamler might be a little bit undervalued. Jerry Judy can move into the slot. Sutton's not a guy that you're going to move into the slot. No, he's of not course that not. Guy. Look, uh, what so, I'm expecting from Sutton is somewhere between six and eight touchdowns and a repeat of the yardage total with maybe 80 catches. And you know what? That's a pretty good value where he is right now. It's. I'm. I'm not going to say he's a terrible value. I think he's going to be a, a low end wide receiver too. I just don't know if there's breakout upside here where he's going to finish as a top five wide receiver with the talent without an injury on that team to one of the major contributors. That's fair. That is fair. This is fun. Yep. <laughs> all right, guys. Let's go outside the top sixty for wide receivers. Tag your first Joke. this time. All right, I get to go first this one. Yeah. All right. I. I'm going to go with Deontay oh, Johnson. Son of a bitch. What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> We, from now on, oh. we have to get together ahead of time. This is, you know, come on. <laughs> well, no, it's a good thing. You know, we usually argue about a lot of things. Uh, but Deontay Johnson, a lot of people are going back and they're looking at last year's stats and they're trying to figure out, okay, Juju's the guy. There's not enough targets to go around. Chase Claypool. Chase Claypool, I don't even think he's going to start. Let's get that out of the way right from the get-go. James Washington is a guy that's never really panned out in the offense as much as we thought he might. Uh, and, you know, drafting Chase Claypool, it signifies that they're moving on from him. They are not mad about Deontay Johnson. I think that they've gotten to the point with James Washington where they said he's just not going to be the player that we expected because they're not going to draft the fourth wide receiver. They're go- James Washington and Chase Claypool are going to compete for that third wide receiver spot. And you can't look at last year's stats. You can't do that because basically Ben Roethlisberger, when he's in the offense, this team throws the ball a ton. They do not run fewer than like 66 plays per game with Ben Roethlisberger on the field. They run a lot of no huddle. They do run a lot of three wide receiver sets. But Deontay Johnson is going to play that Antonio Brown role in the offense. That's what they want him to do. He's been in Ben Roethlisberger's ear all off season. Ben Roethlisberger's been saying some great things about him, saying he wants to be better. He wants to learn. Juju is going back to the slot, which is great for Juju's projection, but Deontay Johnson is locked into 100 targets in this offense. That is actually happening and from Ben Roethlisberger. So when you you take the efficiency increase that you get from Mason Rudolph and Devlin friggin' Hodges <laughs> and you go to Ben Roethlisberger in 105, I have him projected for 105 targets. That's a, a modest projection because I do have the combination of Washington and Claypool kind of battling it out for right around 100 targets. That's I can lower that to 80, and all of a sudden there's there's more targets available in this offense. So yeah, Deontay and Big Johnson Ben threw the ball 675 times the last time he was the starting quarterback. So if that happens did, again, but, and the Steelers defense has gotten better, and I don't think he's going to throw that much coming off the surgery. You know, at age 38 now. There's there's some question marks about that, but I have him down for 598 pass attempts. So I'm being conservative in that because I do believe there right. is opportunity for him to throw a little bit more. But Deontay Johnson, if Juju Smith Schuster really is having issues becoming the guy, uh, I do, I do think it. it helps moving him back to the slot and that's why I like Juju so much this year but Deontay Johnson is going to be a player and a guy that I think you could probably rely on for wide receiver three production this year I agree he was on my list too he wasn't my guy though Joe uh do you want to pick someone else besides Deontay Johnson no I don't I want to pick Deontay Johnson (laughs) to be honest with you I really do uh some of the stuff I came armed with for this argument was again in 2018 the Steelers ran the fourth most plays in football I mean like it's just there is so much potential to bounce back here and yeah, of course, there's always potential for everything to implode as well. But, you know, whether or not Juju is the guy, isn't the guy, that that's neither here nor there. I do agree with Tags 100%. Moving it back into the slot is the best thing that could happen for him. I think that's where yeah. he's comfortable. 
And Deontay Johnson, I mean, despite, I mean, we're talking Mason Rudolph and Devlin freaking Hodges, and he still had 59 catches for 680 and five touchdowns. Like, I mean, can we, can we, you know, I, I mean, if you He's give him 92 targets play. with Ben Roethlisberger, we're going to have a, a good season here. Let, let's give him 100 something targets with Ben Roethlisberger. We're going to have a good season. That, that Pittsburgh offense was abysmal. And I don't even know if that's a good enough word to describe how bad it was at times last year, but maybe it's even worse. But Deontay Johnson, I'm looking at that guy, and we kept looking, okay, there's always another guy that's going to emerge. And when you're looking at a guy, he's outside the top 100, even, Deontay Johnson right now. I mean, he is such a great value. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I would say all the shares, like every single league where he is around, I will take him around early just to make that statement because I don't like to reach for players, but at the same time, I think when you identify, just like last year with Godwin last year with Sutton last year with certain guys that they're going a round or two later than they should take them a round or two earlier than they're going and be ahead of that trend because there's no reason not to. And when you get into the, you know, a hundred overall, it's a crapshoot yeah. anyway for the most part. So why not get yeah. the guy who you think is going to make an impact? And I think Deontay Johnson can make an impact. Debo Samuel is the only one, but that's lame because I said him last year and he really got hurt and didn't play enough and all that stuff. But that's the only other guy outside where, I just think if you could build in a lab the perfect guy for Kyle Shanahan's Debo Samuel, and I just think he's he's a rock star. So that's the only he's other awesome. guy. Yeah, his ADP, by the way, is in the top 50. His ECR is outside the top 60. I don't understand that. Tags, why is everyone in the industry lower on Samuel than his ADP? Uh, it's it's one of those teams that you don't you worry about the the amount of plays you worry about Kyle Shanahan and the distribution of targets you worry about Brandon Ayuk coming in you're gonna have George Kittle healthy for the entire season Jalen Hurd is supposed to be a guy that they were relying on for to do a lot of different things uh some people still believe that Dante Pettis is gonna be a thing uh, <laughs> there's there's just a lot of targets in that <laughs> offense now Devo cut. To be fair, Devo Samuel was a guy that I had ranked around the number 27 wide receiver before I did projections, and uh, I got done with the projections, and I was shocked to see that he went inside my top 20 receivers. I don't know if I'm going to rank him there, but it seems like it's probable that he's actually going to finish as a top 24 wide receiver, Uh, and obviously he flashed last year. I just don't know if he does as much after the catch because he was one of those guys like A.J. Brown where these guys got the ball in their hands and they were just lightning, and uh, you just don't average you know, over seven yards after the catch or whatever these guys were doing. A.J. Brown was like nine uh and see Samuel was somewhere around that territory so yeah. I there's going to be natural regression there you do worry about you know basically just the volume in that offense overall because That's they, they, they want to be a run first had, team had I, li- I like Debo Samuel but everything you said makes sense Jax. all of it makes sense but I'll tell you what I don't think any of them are reason to scare me off Debo Samuel this year because I think sure. had he played a full healthy season last year we would be talking about him in a whole – I mean, we're talking moving about three rounds. Like, that's, that's oh, I think, yeah. where we would be. And that means there's an opportunity this year to get a really good value on Debo. And I think you take that value because the one thing when you watch those 49ers, they run those quick slants over the middle, man. That is what they do. That is pretty much the offense. And I just – I would sit there and I'd watch these games and I'm thinking to myself, how do the defensive coordinators are not, like, just – just defending against this. Like, this is what they do. Make Jimmy Garoppolo throw the ball deep. Make challenge him. Do these things. Take away these short slants. Mm-hmm. And no one would ever do it. And maybe it's maybe it's a testament to the way they're running the offense or or the looks they're giving at the line of scrimmage. Or maybe it's just the talent of Debo. But they couldn't stop it. And they couldn't stop in the playoffs either. And at a certain point, you have to kind of just tip your hat and say, okay, you know what? You have to buy into what's going on here. And this is the last year I think you can buy into it. I don't think any of the reasons that Tag gave, although they're all really good, I don't think any of them are enough to steer me or shy me away from taking a chance on Samuel where he's at in ADP. Yeah. I'm going to have Bobby a lot did... of shares of Hardman from the Chiefs just in case yeah. he surpasses Sammy Watkins. I'm going to have a lot of Nicole shares of Hardman. Rashad Perryman in case he's the wide receiver one for the Jets. Sorry, go ahead, Tags. Uh, yeah. No, don't, don't just just erase the, the Perryman one. Uh, <laughs> but go with I, – I love – the Mikal Hardman was my second guy that I would have okay. said because that dude was, like, <laughs> legit Scary. efficient as hell. Like, over the last 10 years – of every single player that's seen 30 targets or more, he had the fourth most fantasy points per target. Um, he had, the, I think, the third most yards per target. He's uh, a bad he is, man. It, it was crazy efficient. And, yeah. again, and again, there were some big plays in there, but that's what Miko Hardman brings. That's what Andy Reid brings. He's tied to Patrick Mahomes. And if, for whatever reason, they do like kind of just shove him in front of Sammy Watkins a little bit and give him that opportunity, Miko Hardman is true. He has true breakout. How potential. hard is it to defend against the Chiefs this year with Hardman, Hill, I mean, it's with, not with fair. And Sammy Kelsey, Watkins actually Kelsey, was a good football player. I don't know if that's going to happen. But. Yeah. I mean, with, yeah. with Kelsey, with all I these think, guys. I'm like going to say this. Not as hard as is defended against the Cowboys. I disagree. 
I would the rather, Cowboys rather last the year Cowboys. had more yards. You know, per you know play what is? You know what? It's different. I think the Chiefs are more unpredictable in terms yep. of what they can do That's and true. more explosive in terms of what they can do because yep. you know like Tyreek Hill and Michael Hardman alone when they, they touch the ball one time it's just like and now Clyde Edwards Hilaire coming out of the backfield right, and now you've got a little bit more of a balance <laughs> yeah. to the offense which they they lacked last year and you know it's like I know we sat here basically last summer doing the same thing I don't I know I did I was like why is everyone got Damian Williams so damn high can I can I please understand can someone explain yep. this to me like did you I understand and this is the difference between falling in love with a situation but not really evaluating the talent properly. And, you know, going back to the earlier thing with Kenyon Drake, it's the opposite. It's the inverse is evaluating the talent properly and realizing it's, it wasn't his fault, you know, like to quote, uh, <laughs> to quote earlier before we started the show, very good will hunting. I want to just hold Kenyon Drake and say, it's not your fault over and over and over again. Like good will hunting over. <laughs> just not your fault, Kenyon. But this is, this is the difference. And I think you're right. I think Michael Hardman could be a, a, just a terrorizing force this year, potentially. My guy, though, I haven't got to him yet, and this is going to surprise a lot of you because the past two years, I was like, please, actually the past three years, please do not draft Will Fuller. This year, I'm drafting all the Will Fuller, baby. I'll take Brandon Cooks. You'll take Brandon Cooks? I'm okay. going to take a hard pass on everyone. How's that? <laughs> on everyone? You, so you don't that's like Deshaun Watson? I'm going to take Deshaun Watson, saying, and then I'll figure it out later. That's, that's <laughs> No, I, I wouldn't even do that. Honestly, it's going to be bad. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I play a lot of Superflex, so if you're going to give me a discount on him, I mean, I'm going to yeah. take it. So, that's yeah. You know, that's, that's, the, that's my point of view on it. Everyone knows why I'm picking Will Fuller. We talked about wide receivers long enough, so let's move on to the next tier. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to mash quarterbacks and tight ends in together. So, Joe, you get to go first. Give me one quarterback or tight end, and just give me your other name, too, because I know you prepared a second one. Uh, well, look, you know, like, like I just said, I play a lot of super flex. So a guy that when I'm doing the quarterbacks for the for the black book, you know, when you just start peeling into things. When Saquon Barkley was on the field with Daniel Jones last year, Daniel Jones was a really efficient fantasy quarterback. He, he was giving you yeah. points. And uh, I know it's not always pretty, but, you know, Tony Romo wasn't always pretty either. <laughs> and um, I disagree on that. Tony Romo is gorgeous. He's, he's a he's a handsome man. <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, but, you know, it's you were looking for fantasy points. That's what you're looking for. And Daniel Jones can run a little bit. I think they did address some of the offensive line issues in the offseason. Finally, I thought they had a pretty good draft, to tell you the truth. And there was not one game last year where Daniel Jones played with all three of those wide receivers who were pretty darn good. I think Shepard, Slayton, and Tate all have, you know, a, a lot of ability. You have a, a very good tight end in Evan Ingram, and then you have an all-world running back in Saquon Barkley. How many teams can say that they're giving their quarterback that much to work with? So I think Daniel Jones is a super flex quarterback. Looks really good. And I'll tell you what, too. The other thing that was fascinating to me, there's only one guy last year in that big, giant QB1 class that had a touchdown in every single game last year, a passing touchdown. Do you know who that was? Come on, Tags. You got to know. Uh, a rookie no, quarterback no, with a passing not touchdown a every game? Rookie. Give me a, a the QB1 last year who had a touchdown, a, a passing touchdown in every single game last year. Is it Russell? No, Wilson? it was Carson Wentz. I like Carson Wentz a lot. And me too. And, this was, and I'm just this pointing year. this out there for everybody. Like, if you miss out on the guys like Lamar and, and Mahomes, because you don't want to pay that premium, the nice thing to have is consistency. And the one thing I know Wentz ended on a down note with the concussion, but it's football. Like, you can't. Yeah, let's let's not forget that a couple years ago, people were falling over themselves to get Wentz and Watson before they all, you know, tore their ACLs. And the next thing you know, Mahomes yeah. and Lamar Jackson roll into town and they're all like, you know, you know, that meme of the guy holding hands with the girl and everyone, tur the guy turns around. I feel like that yep. was everybody with Carson Wentz <laughs> for like a couple years ago. <laughs> and I, I just want to remind everybody in single quarterback leagues that Wentz was incredibly consistent last year and had so much little to work with in the wide receiving core. Like, it just really, it's just mm -hmm. not good. And it's gotten better. It's not gotten great. But I think a full year, Miles Sanders, we'll see what Rager is. We'll see with all those guys. Like, let's... I like Rager. I, I think that too. offense... I mean, even Deshaun Jackson being healthy is going to help them if a lot. That, if there is such a thing as a healthy Deshaun Jackson now, I'd like to see it. That's true. But I, I just think he's another guy and don't pass on. And in terms of tight end, you know, like, I feel like the soft middle of tight end is where I want to be. Like, I don't want to pay for the first three guys. I want to pay for that Andrews, Ingram kind of grouping of guys, but if I'm going to pass on everybody, I like Noah Fant too, because young quarterbacks tend to look for the tight end. And if we're talking about other options there uh, in the red zone, I think Fant as a rookie tight end showed you glimpses and most rookie tight ends don't even show you that. So I think I'm, I'm excited to see what he gives, but again, that's more of a like, okay, I've passed on tight end. Who do I think can outperform and actually be in the middle potentially next year? And I think Fant could be. 
If there's one thing we've learned from the show, it's that Joe loves the no! <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, dude, I mean, look, that's they a lot has of talent, a lot man. of upside, man. Look, I understand I, that they hiked the ball on one second every still, single time oh, last year. I get that. Like, I get it was not pretty. <laughs> but you know what? They still have Vic Fangio as their head coach, and he's going to limit those you, passes. You're not wrong, but at the same time, it's like, I, I just, I feel like they, yeah. we're going to suppress them so much that they become an afterthought, and I think they're going to be better than that. I just do. I just... I think there's going to be some pressure on there, and I think if there isn't even a slightest step forward in development from the quarterback, you could have a lot going on here. That's all, it's, it's kind of like last year, everybody was crapping all over Daniel. Like everyone, Daniel Jones sucks. He sucks. He sucks. He sucks. Right? And then all of a sudden, he was putting up big fantasy games and be like, "Oh, maybe he doesn't suck so bad." Well, no. Yeah. When you have Saquon Barkley and a bunch of other really good receivers, all of a sudden, like it's a lot easier to play football. And I think right. that's kind of the lock situation. I think he's going to surprise some people. I'll have a lot of third quarterback Drew Lock on my bench in Superflex. I can tell you that right now. I'm going to have some shares of Noah Fant just because if you're getting one of those late round tight ends, first of all, you want someone with a good matchup in week one, and he's got one of the best matchups in week one. But second of all, you want someone with upside who could break out, and if he doesn't, so what? You cut him and you play the streaming game. I think Fant has that upside. It makes sense to me. Um, My tight end would have been Tyler Higbee, but I'm not going tight end. I'm going quarterback. Tags, we're going to let you go first, though, because I'm going to end this show with a bang. I, I mean, got I some went crazy ha- stats on my guy. I would have went Hayden Hurst to tight end 100%. Yeah, I like him too. For me. And Yates like, I wanna loves be- Hurst. I'm going to tell everybody and their grandmother to draft Hayden Hurst this year. Um, that I mean, right now he's a tight end 18 for whatever stupid reason. Um, <laughs> I really do believe people are going to wake up to this and say, wait, what are we doing here? Like, isn't the idea of tight ends, the reason we follow them is for targets? Yeah, we do. And, oh, he, he just happens to play for the Atlanta Falcons. Um, but my, my breakout here that I'm going to go with is Joe Burrow. And I almost never do this with a rookie quarterback. I stay away from rookie quarterbacks. But this kid is poised. He's ready for the NFL. And he has underrated rushing uh, ability. He is a guy that legitimately one of my knocks on him going through the scouting process was that he takes too many damn hits. Like, he doesn't get out of bounds. He does not slide. He is reckless in a, in a way. And it reminds me, like, if you go back to Cam Newton's rookie year, he's not going to run like Cam Newton. I'm not saying that. But Cam Newton threw for multiple, like, I think there was a 400-yard game in there. There was another 300-yard game. Because it was a rookie and teams almost they expected them to run the ball quite a bit and cam newton was able to throw the ball for a lot of yards joe burrow has one of the better receiving cores in football you like you look at this receiver depth chart and you say if aj green is healthy he's a top he's definitely a top 10 wide receiver in the nfl uh if healthy obviously there's some ifs there tyler boyd has proven the ability to play in this in this league as one of the better slot receivers out there you have john ross who can stretch the field um you have t higgins who they drafted at the top of the second round who's another guy that can stretch the field uh he should be under aj green's tutelage and get better uh joe mixon can catch passes out of the backfield giovanni bernard can catch passes of the backfield they're getting jonah williams their first round pick back from last year uh they have a lot of equity invested in that offensive line and then you look at the defense this is like a situation you could look at the tampa bay bucks last year and find so much correlation between the two you have tyler boyd playing that kind of chris godwin that slot receiver who's going to be peppered with targets you have mike evans aj green you have you don't even have the running back that you do with the Bengals. but this this defense is so bad that they are going to be forced into throwing the ball yeah. a lot. And the, fortunately, they have a guy, an offensive mind, and Zach Taylor, who yep. kind of was screwed in his first year. He just lost so many damn players. It was going to be difficult for him to do much. So I love this Bengals offense, and I think Joe Burrow, in my projection, he came in at number 12 quarterback. And again, I am being conservative because I know how much I like him. Uh, but that's where I came in because I do think that mobility that he offers you, I would take him over someone like Daniel Jones because Daniel Jones is just too inconsistent for me. Uh, he was a guy that it was either four or five touchdowns or one. Uh, he has a lot of fumbling issues, and I, I, this team needs to go back to Saquon Barkley and run the ball through him. They talked about building the offensive line in the draft because they wanted to run the ball more. I think that's going to happen. Again, he has tons of skill position players but i think that joe burrow is someone that they're actually going to lean on uh to win football games and kind of need to because their defense is so piss poor tags listen to this man joe burrow qb ecr number 21 yep i mean i'm not Super drafting him because he's playing the chargers if it's a super flex league i'll draft joe burrow all day well the he's 20 the chargers in week on, one i'm not playing him in week one the 21 is based on the exceptional last year combined with the question mark of what happened before that why didn't everything click why no was- not overall i'm talking quarterback i know he's going behind jimmy garoppolo and kirk cousins and jared goff right and and i think that's because people just feel more warm and fuzzy with those guys and and that's yuck i look i mean inconsistency thy name is kirk cousins i mean like you know like it's just and, and yeah. i get that and i understand why mike is excited about joe burrow and i actually think he's going to be better than a lot of other people do 
And in yeah. super flex leagues, I can tell you right now, I'm going to have some Joe Burrow shares because defense is bad. As long as AJ Green is healthy and on that team, that is a that's a huge win. That that to me is a is a make or break for Joe Burrow. In in my opinion, as great as Mixon is, as much as I love him, you give a rookie wide uh, a rookie quarterback a guy like AJ Green, and uh, I think then all of a sudden, like you're like, okay, now we're in business because yeah. that's a guy you can learn a lot from, and that's a guy that can really help a, a development just kind of. Just sore. And and Burrow's like, a, I don't know, I, I find Burrow to be one of these guys, too, he's almost in that Brady mode where every time you tell him no <laughs> or, he's, or it's not going to work, whatever it is, he just wants to stick it up your butt. And, like, I love that, man. That's that's awesome. Like, And and I think that's that's something you look for in your quarterback, you know, that guy, that type of personality. Mm-hmm. And I think he is that type of personality. And that's the thing that when you look at some other quarterbacks who have had – like, Jay Cutler had a lot of talent, right? But Jay Cutler, I don't know if he ever had that kind of – that M.O. or that that vibe. Joe Flacco, same thing. It's like he had a big arm and stuff like that. But did he ever have that sort of leadership thing? Burrow has that weird intangible quality that I really like in a quarterback. And you can't sure. – you can't doesn't show up in the box score. It shows so up when Baker you're watching. Mayfield. Yeah. Well, and that's why yeah. I haven't given up on Baker Mayfield because Me Freddie either. Kitchens yeah. was yeah. – Well, he didn't have an offensive line last year. Well, but also he also didn't have a football head coach. You know, Freddie, That's true. Yes. Freddie, Co- Freddie Kitchens was – He's, he's probably the worst head, head coach head. I've seen in a decade. It, he's definitely in that conversation. Um, yeah. yeah, Adam Gase would like to raise his hand and say, "I uh, hold my beer," <laughs> uh, but <laughs> but I think I think you're talking about let's let's give him Stefanski. Let's get a, a guy who's far more prepared to be a head coach in the NFL, and let's see what Baker Mayfield is in year three. Right. Yep. So tags Cam Newton finished QB three as a rookie. Robert Griffin the third finished QB five. Andrew Luck QB ten as a rookie. What's Burrow's upside? What's his ceiling here? Uh, I will say that his ceiling, I'll go top six. I, I don't know if I would say that he's going to be top three. Um, I, it's not to say that's not possible, but it's just so rare for a quarterback to get there. And you have to have – the reason that I say that even top six is because he does have that rushing upside that I think a lot of people are underrating. He's obviously a great passer. He just set a whole bunch of, a bunch of records. But uh, if he's a guy that's got to move out of the pocket, and he does that extremely well. That, again, that's one of the things I like about Burrow is that he's so poised in the pocket. He does not overreact to pressure. He, know it's, he knows it's there, and he's going to need to know it's there, obviously, with the way that the Bengals' offensive line has played, even though they, they have upgraded are getting Jonah Williams back. But uh, I like Burrow a lot, and again, he's not scared to run the football. He's not scared to do that, and this is a team that should average a ton of plays per game. Um, again, there's just so many parallels to to a team like the the Bucks last year, where nobody wanted to draft Jameis Winston. And are there going to be some bad games because he's a rookie? Probably. Uh, but I, I think once you get outside the cup, first couple quarterbacks like Lamar Jackson, uh, Dak Prescott, uh, Patrick Mahomes, those guys, once you get outside those guys, you're going to have some duds from everyone. So uh, I, I would say top six is a ceiling for Joe Burrow, but... Um, sure. Again, projections have him as a top twelve quarterback. I'm not. It's tough to rank him there. I'll say that I can't but, um, rank him but, twelve, but I love yeah. it. I love the. It's look, you call. can basically. I mean, there's going to be moments this year in a Superflex where he he could be your third quarterback on in some la- like if you are aggressive at the quarterback position and other people aren't, he could be your third guy. <laughs> I will say that I if you take him if you if you wait and take him as your QB two I'm I am more than okay because like I the idea that I want in, in superflex or two quarterback leagues what you want you want a quarterback who has liter- legitimately zero chance of getting benched there is zero chance that Joe Burrow gets benched yeah yep. I would agree with that sentiment you're absolutely right okay guys uh, my quarterback so sometimes the group think in the industry just goes a little bit too far and we get these false ideas of who a player has actually been. So my quarterback was third all time in passing yards for the first four seasons of his career and top 10 in, t- in touchdowns. And he did it with Adam Gase as his head coach and limited weapons in Miami. And then he got hurt. Adam Gase came in, absolutely destroyed him. He uh, went to uh, Tennessee. He was the backup for Marcus Mariota. And then what happened? He got the starting job with decent weapons. And he came in and he scored over 30 points per game in 10 games last season. In the 10 games that he started, I think he's the breakout quarterback this season. Ryan Tannehill. And in fact, I'm taking plus 8,000 odds on Ryan Tannehill winning the NFL MVP this year. That's a bold, my friend. silence falls over the podcast. (laughs) <laughs> he was absolutely phenomenal and you want to talk about from fantasy standpoint he runs the ball as well if you take his fantasy points divided by his pass attempts here's the leaders lamar jackson number one deshaun watson number two ryan Tannehill right behind watson at 0.81 fantasy points per pass attempt then it drops all the way down to russell wilson at 0.65 
Tannehill was extraordinary last year from a fantasy perspective. He was ridiculous. And if the volume goes up, just how much better does it get? The fantasy points per pass attempt doesn't apply to mobile quarterbacks as much. Like, you have to kind of do it. You have to separate it and say how many fantasy points per pass attempt. And you break it down to to actually point uh, fantasy points from passing and then from rushing. But either way. My, I like Tannehill, and I, I I'm not I'm not going to sit here and say that he's a bad football player. Uh, he was he was a lot better than I think people gave him credit for before he came to Tennessee. Um, but Bobby, I even bumped him up in pass attempts to 488, which is like which would be like legitimately a big bump from last year for this Tennessee Titans offense. Even still averaging six point or seven point five yards per attempt, having a five point one percent touchdown rate, he comes in at like the QB twenty. It's it's not great. Uh, there's just Hold it's just not enough volume. You bumped him down to seven point five. You took you lopped twenty five percent off his efficiency. Yes, I mean, I mean, before this, <laughs> yes, Bobby, God, yes, I, I, again, AJ AJ Brown. If you remove, if you literally cut his yards uh, after catch in half, which is very, very, very likely. It's, Bobby, by the way, seven point five is 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 still very, very, very good. Oh, um, it's very good. He did that in Miami, man. He had seven point seven in Miami under Adam Matthews, Gase. Matthew Stafford has done that twice in his entire career. R- Ryan Tannehill is a lot better 7. than 5. Matthew Stafford. Ryan Tannehill is so much. Whoa, Ryan Tannehill was whoa, the number. Whoa, whoa. Ryan Tannehill was the number one quarterback in Pro Football oh, Focus. This is great. Man. I'm waiting for somebody to tell they somebody watch- to go get their shine box. This is Ryan Tannehill was un freaking <laughs> believable. Okay, listen to this. If Ryan Tannehill had kept up his efficiency last year for 521 passes, he would have beat Lamar Jackson in fantasy points, dude. Hold on a second. Do we want to? Do we have a bet right here? Can, can I say I'll take Joe Burrow? You take Ryan Tannehill. Is that our bet for That's this year? That's our bet for the year. Oh, Bring it on. I will you are sanction screwed. that bet. You are screwed. Subscribe to the I'm, Fantasy Bros podcast so you can know all year long how this bet's going because this is. And I be like crazy. Joe Burrow, but Ryan Tannehill is the man. This is the, the Tennessee best. Titans are winning the Super Bowl this year, guys. You know they have who the most complete is? team. You know they have the, the most is? complete team in the NFL. I'm gonna tell you who the man is. Okay, the man is Derrick Henry. That's the man. That's yeah. who the man. You know what's going to be weird? You know what's going to be that? weird is me standing by my TV rooting for Derrick Henry every week. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's funny? Ryan Daniels going to rush for like I'm, ten I'm touchdowns, tired of baby. The, the disrespect for Derrick Henry because I was tired of it last year. You know, I came on this very show last year. We did our hot. You know, we remember our prediction show and all that stuff. You go back and listen last year. It was Derrick Henry's going to lead the league in rushing. I know I only got it by a couple yards, but I still got it. <laughs> you know what? So I don't care. But you know what? What's fun about that is. We've, we've gotten to this weird place in fantasy where we we care so much about, like, well, the target volume and all these other things. Like, we kind of forget, like, yards are yards, right? Touchdowns are touchdowns. Who's the focal point of their offense? Like, all that stuff still matters. We're just living in an age where there's just not a lot of those guys. And, and Henry's a throwback kind of guy in a throwback kind of offense. And I just feel like that guy gets undervalued and underappreciated. And I understand why people would rather take Alvin Kamara on their team. I, I get that. But I don't know, man. There's something about I've seen Derrick Henry in person, and I don't want to get anywhere near tackling He's that a guy. Big dude. I'm not telling you right now. I am not tackling that guy. Like, you, like here you go. Here's my check. Like, sorry, I'm gonna gonna turn it in that week. <laughs> I'm not tackling him. And I and I and you could see the Ravens also felt the same last year <laughs> in the playoffs. But uh, look, I think I think what Bobby's saying about Tannehill is is you know when you get it with, like we say about everybody when you get out of that Adam Gase you know world. All of a sudden, good things happen. Kenyon Drake, Lamar Miller. Uh, I mean, like the list goes on and on, right? Of all these guys who, yeah. like, you know, which is ruined by the Dolphins, and then they yeah. all go on to better places. <laughs> all of a sudden, and my point is, he was good even with Adam Gase. He was a top ten. He fantasy was improving also, and then everything hit the wall, and then the injury hit. Like yeah. he was yeah. making incremental improvements. I agree because I remember going back a couple years ago in the Black Book and and looking very hard at Tannehill and saying, "Look, there was some incremental year over year. I forget which year to year it was off the top of my head, but I was like, there's some things going in the right trajectory." And then it bottomed out, and then injury, and then, you know, the Dolphins. And then next thing you know, it's like he's a backup in Tennessee. And I think all of us last year were all thinking that Tannehill was going to play more games in Mariota, and we were all right about that. Yeah. So I'm looking right now at who should I draft on uh, Fantasy Pros, and I typed in Ryan Tannehill and Joe Burrow. There are 74 experts who have filled out their rankings. Joe, I want you to guess how many of them are on Tannehill, how many are on Burrow? Wait, 74, you said? 74, yeah. How many are on Tannehill, how many are on Burrow? Um... I imagine it's like a split, right? So actually, you know what? No, I'm guessing I'm, Tannehill I'm say, is like 75%. No, you think it's that high? I do. 
It's higher. No. Why? It's higher, baby. And I've got it sorted by the most over, the most accurate experts last year. Number one has Tannehill three higher. Number two has Tannehill two higher. Number three has Tannehill at number 10 overall, four higher. Uh, you have to go all the way down to number 15 to find the first guy who has Burrow higher. That's madness. That's fine. I get it. I get it. I mean, again, uh, before I did my projections, I probably would have been like, eh, it's close. But after going through it, I don't even think it's close. All right. Well, I this is going to be a lot of fun. By the way, Dan Harris is with you. I see that. Let me check out where Yates is. And then we can end the show. Oh, Yates has uh, has a Joe Burrow way higher than Tan Hill. So everyone yeah, on the Yates podcast is, Yates, is against me. Because Yates is a projections guy. Yates is a projections guy. I'm a projections guy. Well, not enough. <laughs> 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 all right, guys. That's all for today's show. Joe, thank you so much for coming on. As always, it was a blast. And uh, you guys got some bonus content because we went a little bit long, but uh, we need that today, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Listen, guys, I want to thank you guys for the time here. And I want to thank Fantasy Pros also for lending – me, two of my favorite people, you two, to take part in the Black Book. And if people want to uh, get their Black Book fun. and see a little uh, little special nuggets there from uh, Mr. Teglier. In fact, he actually did put a whole thing in there, Joe Burrow. So it's in there. It's in the Black Book. And Bobby <laughs> stuff with uh, is in there as well. So go check it out on Amazon right now. You can get your hard copy. You can get your Kindle version. It'll be on iTunes in a couple of weeks. But uh, And thank you to everyone who already got it. Because number one in football in June, that's madness, man. Love you guys. Thank you cool. so much. And this was fun, man. This was this was good. This is not even work. This is don't tell everybody, but this is like I don't know. This is like what it's supposed to be. Every three people getting in here, talking it up like this, really good conversation. This was a blast. Absolutely, it was a blast. And guys, don't forget to sign up uh, for the giveaways we've got going on right now. Go to i go to Apple Podcast or Stitcher. Leave us an honest review. Take a screenshot of it and send it to us at fantasypros.com slash contest actually that's the website fantasypros.com slash contest send it to contest at fantasypros.com and we're giving away um a signed what was it uh deandre, DeAndre hopkins, hopkins uh helmet Cardinals helmet Ooh, and we're giving away a fielder's I want that. Uh, and we're giving away a fielder's choice vintage leather baseball wallet you guys are gonna love this again you can check out the details at fantasypros.com slash contest for joe pisapia and mike taglier i'm bobby sylvester thanks for listening and enjoy your football Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos. And while you're at it, give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook so that you can get the latest news and updates that'll give you the edge in your fantasy league.